afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our market update with Axel Pignon from Carmignac. So these market updates are usually uh, laden with jargon <laughs> and reserved for institutional or expert investors. But we wanted to bring you this because we think it, they, these are very interesting. It's important to understand the macroeconomy, but also understand um, the stock market, whether you're an investor or you're not investing yet. Um, I think there's a lot of like, you know, great tips and, and knowledge you can get for, from this. Um, so before we start, I actually have a very quick poll for you, uh, two questions, there's no right or wrong answer, so I'm going to launch that, and I'll give you one, uh, one minute uh, to answer. So first, do you think the stock market will recover in 2023? Wow, I already see a few, <laughs> a few answers. And are you an investor? Uh, and just a quick tip for the second question. Remember, if you have a workplace pension, you may not uh, see yourself as an investor, but you're an investor in the stock market. Um, so I let a few people answer. Wow, it's, the first question is quite close. <laughs> About 50-50. 49, yes. OK, great. Thank you so much. So do you think, let me end the poll and share the results with you. So 48% uh, percent think that, yes, the stock market will recover 52% no. <laughs> so Axel, it's great because we're going to look at what's going to happen, what, what could be happening yeah. in 2023. I'll try to give insight on that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and are you an investor? 76% yes, so well done. 24% no or not yet. Uh, so again, we'll try to give you a few tips on you know, how to get started, how to review your portfolio, and like uh, very practical things for you for you to get started. Um, so thank you so much uh, for answering this, this first poll. So you said, you know, do you think the stock market will recover in 2023? Just a quick one to see, you know, where we are today. This is a quick screenshot of the S&P 500, the S&P, the Standard and Poor's 500, or simply, you know, we call it the S&P 500. It is a stock market uh, index tracking the stock performance of the 500 largest uh, companies listing, listed in, on stock, stock exchanges in the US. And we use it because it's seen a little bit as a you know, benchmark, a barometer. It's one of the most commonly followed equity indices. So of course, Alex will, Axel will deep dive uh, into like lots of different stocks um, and, and markets, but it's, it's always quite easy to just take a screen, screenshot and see where we are. So as you can see, you know, the stock market has been coming down for, you know, over the past year since January 2022. Um, we've seen a lot of inflation. We've seen the Fed trying to, you know, tackle inflation uh, by rising interest rates. And we've seen a decline in investor confidence. So where are we today? Is the stock market going to go up, down? So we're going to see with Excel what, what we think is going to happen um, next year. And Axel, we're so happy to have you today. Welcome again. Thank to you very webinar. much, Emily, for having me. And, uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be back uh, with all this great community and to and speak about markets. Of course. And, and you're back with great news. I mean, congratulations. Uh, you've been promoted at Carmignac, you know, portfolio yes, advisor thank and you member very much. <laughs> of the investment committee. So this is also a little celebration. Uh, can you explain a little bit what is what is your role um, and how you you know what's your day day to day job? Yeah, definitely. So so Carmignac is a is a company uh, selling a mutual fund across Europe and in the UK, and so our job is really on a day to day basis to to manage this fund, so to invest in market both equity and fixed income market. And so I'm part of the uh, investment committee, so investment team following market on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, and trying to explain to our client what we are doing, explaining the move, uh, reassuring them uh, and uh, help them to, to invest with us uh, on financial markets. So I'm sure you're doing a, a lot of these updates <laughs> to, to your clients. Definitely. Uh, and <laughs> and today, today we're focusing on, you know, what happened in 2022 uh, at the, you know, economy, um, macroeconomic level, what's the deal with inflation, what will happen as China reopens. I think yes. that's something we started to talk about in the previous uh, webinar, but that's going to be really important for 2023. And looking at the outlook and you also picked like four stocks just to be able for us to compare and know what to do with like different market conditions that we're going to see in Europe uh, versus the US versus China. So that's going to be um, super interesting. 
Just a quick disclaimer for everyone. Remember that we are not here to give you any financial or investment advice. Our focus is really on education. And as you know, um, market can go up, market can go down. So don't invest the money that you can afford to. Okay. And then you can share your, and your I'm presentation. I'm starting to share mine. Perfect. Yeah, I think I, I wanted, I mean, we, we, when we're discussing this, this webinar, we, we started to talk about, you know, 2022. It, it would be nice to have a recap to know where we stand. So maybe, you know, 2022 was the year of all the superlatives. <laughs> can you Definitely. just do a quick recap of what happened? Yeah, it has been a tough year for everyone, uh, for investors, for uh, consumer, for government, for central banker. Uh, everyone struggled uh, this year due to one thing. It was surging inflation. We hit a 40-year high in the US, in the UK, and in the Eurozone that led to a complete collapse of equity and bond markets. Uh, global equity were down uh, minus 16% last year. It was pretty similar for fixed income indices. Of course, there is always country doing better than others. And uh, the ones that did well last year were all the commodity exporting countries. So especially in Latin America that are a huge exporter of commodities. And you know, uh, energy prices, commodities have, uh, have been the only asset classes up last year. So they have benefited from that. But Europe and the UK have been able to outperform the US market last year, which is pretty rare, to be honest. Uh, and it's, uh, it was thanks to the weak currencies that have boosted uh, our exporting companies uh, in Europe and so help uh, these countries to, to outperform the US. And they have been losers, big losers, like last year. Uh, first, uh, among the losers, yeah, we had China that has been hurt by a lasting anti-COVID policy, uh, which uh, penalized growth, and I will come back uh, on that. Among losers, we had also the tech sector, and, and we mentioned it uh, in our previous webinar, and once again, I'm sure we will talk about it. And finally, we had the crypto markets, because we all know it, cryptocurrency are highly volatile, we have a track record, a bit of a boom and bust cycle, you know, and the year uh, and this year, crypto markets um, have uh, exacerbating all the negative factors that have been affecting the market. And these factors are the following: the fact that we had an inflation shock that has led to a rate shock. So first, maybe a quick recap of what happened on the inflation front. You remember, we talked about it uh, in September, inflation, it is a measure of the rate of rising price and good services in an economy. So it's a loss of purchasing power over time. But what happened is that after years of relative low, uh, relatively low inflation, because for instance, in the US over the last 10 years, inflation was on average below 2%, and it was pretty similar for the UK. But last year, we reached 9% in the US. And this pressure this started uh, as soon as in 2021 with the reopening of the economy post-COVID that have resulted in a fast rebound in demand, a rebound much sharper than uh, the one in supply, uh, which have fueled inflation. We have also an effect on wages because we had a lot of labor shortage, especially in the service industries uh, across the world. Once again, that was an effect post-COVID, but all in all, it, it creates a wage pressure uh, to increase, to go up, and it was a starting point of what we call a wage price spiral. And finally, the last factor to explain this inflationary shock, it was commodities. It started with oil and with the reopening effect post-COVID, and then it has accelerated with the, the, the war in, uh, in, in Ukraine, uh, which has increased pressure on gas, but also on food. So it's an issue because when inflation is high, it feeds itself. So when workers receive a wage hike, they demand more goods, more services, and this in turn causes price all over the place to rise. And then it becomes very, very tough to go out of this inflation, uh, inflation loop. And so this is why last year, central banks across the globe has to step in very, very quickly to stop this inflation. And what they did is raising interest rate uh, across the world, which creates this rate shock that had a direct impact on both equity and fixed income. 
Thanks, Alex, for uh, Axel, <laughs> for this for this recap on you know 2022, and and it's definitely something we we talked about over the past you know two, two webinars where it was really hard to see you know where where are we going. But now, if we just you know move forward, uh, you know let's uh, turn to 2023. What's going to happen in terms of growth, in terms of inflation? We're hearing uh, you know a lot of you know discussions, press, news about um, recession, about inflation. Um, it can look a bit scary for investors. So, you know, how uh, we should we should approach 2023? So first for 2023, we have a good news on the inflationary front because the peak of inflation is finally be behind us, as you can see on the chart. Uh, and we are now entering a period of decelerating inflation in both US and Europe. And this deceleration of inflation is led by what we call the most cyclical component of inflation, namely energy prices that are turning lower, and the fact that we have less bottleneck uh, after the strong supply demand imbalance that we had post COVID. And in Europe, it's also helped by all the fiscal measures that has been taken by the various governments in order, for instance, to cap energy prices. So slowing inflation, it's a relief for everyone and even for financial markets that have rallied a lot since the lows of October. For instance, the S&P 500 is up 12% since October. So we see that it's a relief. But there is one component of inflation that remain highly resilient, it's wages. And wages are, are still growing at a, at a very quick pace in the US, but also in the UK. In the UK, in the private sector, wage growth is around more than 7%. So it's quite important. And it's feeding inflation uh, on a sticky manner, which make, make us think that inflation will not go back below the 2% like we used to know over the last 10 years. Because if we add to the fact to, that wages are still going up, there is also several structural reasons that make us think that inflation could be above what we have known over the last 10 years. And this thing has, uh, has, uh, has became real with the pandemic and the war on Ukraine because we realize that for instance, the supply of labor, strategic commodities, or even the diffusion of technologies are subject to new constraints. And as soon as we have the, more, the word constraint, it means inflation. But this comes also on the top of several structural trends that over the last year were highly disinflationary and are now reverting. Among them, we have the acceleration of the energy transition, which is leading to massive investment in renewable energies, uh, alternative energy. And therefore, as it is huge investment, it's costly over the short and medium term, and therefore threading inflation. But we have also a reason behind, which is uh, globalization, because over the last year, what we had is that global trend has been declining as a percentage of GDP. because as until a few years ago, globalization and the competition that we have across country was really resulting in highly disinflationary pressure. All the price were going down because we have strong competition among countries. Now, government, consumer are pushing for what we call nearshoring or reshoring, which is really the transfer of a business operation to a nearby country. Uh, and that's true. We want to secure supply chain. We want to decrease our environmental footprint by producing closer to a home. So therefore, it's costing more and creating inflation. And the last effect is a demographic one. We know that uh, across our developed economies, uh, population is getting older and older. And it's creating a, a, sh a shock to the job market because we have left people, le less people to, to on the job market. And therefore, we have a lower unemployment rate and higher wages because we want to attract people in our industry. And so it's putting pressure on wages in a structural manner. And we have also the same issue in China, uh, because I don't know if you heard, but two weeks ago, uh, we had the big news that for the first time since the 60s, the Chinese population was decreasing. So there is less and less young people in the Chinese job market. Therefore, we need to pay them more in order to attract them in the company. And it, it, it has an effect for China, but also 
for the rest of the world. So all these structural forces uh, will cause a higher inflation backdrop, that's for sure. But can inflation be a good thing? Because that's the question that we want to know. And surprisingly, yes. Because why inflation can be harmful, too little inflation can also weaken the economy. So we need a, an in-between, uh, which is around 2% 2, 2%, uh, to make sure that uh, we have household businesses making financial sound decision on saving, investing, and borrowing money. And having the right level of inflation is the job of central banks. Thank you, Axel. Um, and yeah, exactly. I wanted you to, to comment and link that back maybe to the to the growth and what we should be expecting. And I think when, when we looked at this graph, for me, it was amazing to understand like the different cycles um, and, and globally, where are, you know, the different uh, regions? Yeah, because the issue is that unfortunately, when we have lower inflation, it's coming generally with lower growth. And what we expect for, for this year is the growth engine of the global economy to shift from the Atlantic bloc, so Europe and US, to China. So it's a complete reverse configuration of what we had last year. However, on the Atlantic, Atlantic bloc, so in Europe and in the US, we have, over the rest of months, uh, better news, and we have raised growth forecast uh, in our economy. Everyone a few months ago were expecting a very dark scenario on growth due to several factors. But at the end, we have better news. Better news in the US uh, because we were expecting a recession uh, as soon as the first uh, semester of this year. Uh, but at the end, it should be end of this year due to the fact that the US consumer is still super healthy because he had significant wage growth and he has a lot of savings still from the pandemic. And so we are delaying uh, the probability of recession in the US. In China, and I will come back to that, uh, we are not at the same, uh, at the same, uh, at the same uh, place of the cycle because China will start to rebound thanks to the end of the zero COVID policy that will boost Chinese growth. And in Europe, uh, the worst should be behind, or we are in the middle of the worst that we can imagine in terms of growth. Uh, and it should be less worse than initially anticipated, because in Europe, we are facing a better external environment. Uh, I was mentioning China reopening policy. It's a very, very good news for Europe, as we are exporting to China. And the fact that also the US recession is postponed is also good news uh, for, for, for Europe because it is one, it is our biggest partner. In Europe, we're also benefiting, we're also benefiting from, from better gas and energy situations thanks to the fact that we have mild temperature across Europe this winter and a very high level of gas storage. So it is limiting the risk of rationing, uh, which was the big fear in our European economy. Now it seems a risk that is much less important. And so better news on the gas front, better news on the external environment are leading to a better general sentiment. Business and consumer confidence is improving. But all in all, what we are facing is really a desynchronization of the economic cycle across the world. China recovering while Europe is going out of what we call the mild recession, when the US should enter one at the end of the year. And this desynchronization of the economic cycle offer a lot of attractive opportunity for investors, and, and we will talk about it. Thank you, Axel. And we'll do, I mean, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, you know, to add them to the, to the Q&A. Um, but for me, like in summary, so yeah, we've seen, you know, inflation in the US, either 40 year high, collapse of the equity markets and China stocks and crypto in 2022. The economy has been shocked by central bank rates, hikes and, and inflation. And now going to into 2023, um, we still have inflation. Inflation is slowing down according to, to your forecasts, but that should remain sticky due to the energy transition, peak globalization and, and demography. And on your last slide, if we just come back to the one you had about, about growth and economic cycle, um, that's something I think that's really interesting to understand how you know, countries will go from this like recession, recovery and uh, recovery expansion and slowdown 
Um, and if you want to learn more about that, there's some really good videos by um, investor Ray Dalio called Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. And I can share that in the, in the chat box. Very short videos. And that, really, that explains really well what you've just explained, like really well, Axel. But if you want to spend more time uh, on that and understanding the, the economic cycle. Um, Please feel free to add your questions, but maybe I can I can ask with with one Excel. Um, um, we at, at the moment we expecting to see further rate interest rate rise uh, from from the Fed, uh, for example, to tackle inflation. We expecting like smaller um, smaller rise. What about the, the impact of the size of you know of, of the move of the of the central banks? Because what if we're expecting something, but then they do a higher rise? What is going to be the, the impact on the on the stock market and our investments? Yeah, and it's true. What you say is true for uh, the the Fed. It's true also for the Bank of England. It's true for the European uh, European Central Bank. What we have to keep in mind is that markets are always uh, anticipating things. And for markets after a very tough uh, 2022, uh, markets are seeing several good news, uh, which are pushing stock market uh, uh, higher. For instance, I was mentioning the S&P rebounding uh, 12% since the lows of October. Uh, when we look at European indices, it's uh, up almost 20% since the low. So a, a nice recovery because we had growth forecasts, like I, like I was mentioning, that has been raised across major regions. We have inflation that is decreasing and therefore boosting consumer confidence across the world, boosting growth. And as we have less inflation, the central bank might be allowed to pause the hiking cycle in uh, around mid-year. So it will start by increasing rates, but a bit less than what they had done last year. And then they will pause. And like I was saying, markets are always forward looking. And this is why they have rebounded so much over the last weeks. However, what we have to keep in mind is that the rate will remain high for a very, very long period of time. Because I was, as I was mentioning, and you and you remind us, Emily, in your in your conclusion, is that inflation will remain sticky. And we are still facing huge pressure from the labor market. So it's putting a kind of a cap on valuation expansion for equity market. And now what equity market will be focused on if it's less on central bank monetary policy, it will be about earnings. And we are in the middle of uh, the earnings season. So all the companies are publishing their earnings for, for last year and giving their forecast for, for, for next year. And we, can, we should see some earning weakness emerging. We, when we talk to companies, it's, all, it's already something that they are mentioning. The fact that they have more and more margin pressure. More margin pressure because uh, until now, they have been able to raise prices and people were still consuming. But as inflation will start just decreasing, but wage will remain super high, Company will be less able to keep raising prices like they did last year. And therefore, margin will get squeezed in the middle. And so we should see some, uh, some downward, what we call downward revision on earnings, uh, meaning that investors will expect less earning growth from companies than what they used to have over the over last year or the year before. And therefore, it can keep some kind of pressure on equity markets uh, for this year, or at least the first part of the year, just the time to just adjust you know, your prediction uh, and everything. Thank you, Axel. And, and maybe a, a second question before we, we continue to the, you know, to the market outlook. Um, there's been a lot of news in the you know, tech sector recently um, and a lot of layoffs, actually. Um, can you tell us maybe the expected impact on, on again, like you know, share prices uh, for these? And are we in a, you know, in a tech bubble? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we had a lot of news uh, again last week huh, with Microsoft, Google uh, confirming that they will cut respectively 10,000 and 12,000 jobs. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that all these big tech companies have increased a lot their workforce in 2022. And they had done a lot of headcount expansion uh, that uh, are starting to look a bit overly optimistic because the economy has turned since then. 
uh, indeed, just to have in mind, uh, uh, Google increased its workforce by 70% last year compared to the year before. Facebook, Microsoft have done the same, adding 19% and 20% to their workforce. So it was huge. And now that they are realizing that, OK, economy has turned and the investor mindset may have changed. And we, talk, we will talk about it later. But this, the model of this tech company was based you know, on huge investment program in order to fuel long-term growth at the cost of short-term profitability. Now that we are getting towards the end of accommodative monetary policy, Investors are looking more and more for profitability that can be delivered in the near term. And so that's why companies like Facebook, for instance, uh, which remain way too aggressive in its investment in long-term initiative, uh, ha, despite the fact that they are keep investing in long-term initiative, despite the fact that they are seeing a sharp deceleration uh, in their expecting revenue growth. Uh, but this is why the stock is down more than 60% last year. And we think that this mindset of investors still looking for profitability rather than very long-term growth uh, will prevail uh, next year. And so that's why most of the tech companies have understood it. And they are announcing layoff, budget cuts. Uh, and we think that it will prevail still uh, uh, this cost-saving measure uh, in the coming months. Well, thank you. I think it's it's really important to understand the, the link between um, the economy, the macroeconomy, and what's what's happening on the on the market. And this is what we wanted to do with the the second section of this of this webinar is really trying to see the impact on investors and the on the stock market. So maybe if we go back to these like economic cycles, can you please tell us how we should adjust our investments, adjust our portfolios if we are a bit more active investors? Um, to try to make the most of our money. Yeah, and, and even if you are not very active investor, I think it's important to, to be in the foot of the ones that are maybe managing your money. Uh, you have on your screen what we call uh, in our business an investment clock. It's a diagram that really sum up which asset classes and sector tend to do best at each stage of the global economic cycle. So it's a simple, yep, very helpful framework to understand the economic cycle and the link with investment. And the classic cycle will start from the bottom left and move clockwise as bonds, stock, commodities, and cash will outperform in terms. But of course, the actual market is always more complicated than in theory, and sometimes the clock can move backward or skip a phase, but still it's very useful because it gives you a framework for analysis. So if we look very quickly at the four phase, we have the phase one that sees the recovery when growth is picking up and we have a very low level of inflation. Therefore, it's the best period for stocks. Uh, and typically that's where China is currently. And in this recovery phase, we look for companies that can benefit from better growth prospect in the world and that could exhibit very high valuation. Because valuation, uh, which is the, how much investor estimates the value of a firm, does not matter at this phase of the cycle, meaning investors are ready to pay an, a very expensive price for a company that will offer them long-term growth. In the second phase of the expansion, growth is accelerating sharply, approaching its peak, and inflation accelerates. As inflation is accelerating, it's a very, very bad moment to invest in bonds because bonds hate inflation and we have seen it last year and on equity you will focus more on companies that are late in the cycle it's often commodities or very cyclical companies that offer cheap valuation because inflation inflation is bad for bonds but also for high valuation company then you enter the slowdown growth is decelerating inflation keep rising so what you are doing as an investor is you start decreasing your overall level of risk and you start buying companies that do well independently of the cycle. And it's exactly the case of the US currently. And the last phase is the recession. Growth is negative. Inflation is going down. It's the best timing to buy bonds. And on the equity side, you will be very, very cautious and buy only very defensive sector like staples, healthcare, it's exactly the case of Europe for the moment. So the fact that economic cycles are desynchronized across country currently is great for an investor because we can 
just cherry pick the right asset class, the right sector uh, across region, and therefore expanding our number of opportunity. And this is why also it is very important for an investor to be global and not only focus on one region. And actually, st starting from this, um, something we discussed was, OK, if we now deep dive uh, a little bit more and we look at stocks, we look at shares, we look at, you know, potentially where you could put your money. And, and again, Axel said it, but you don't need to be an active investor and pick your own stocks. I mean, that that can be really risky. But I was really interested in, in understanding how managers actually build their, their portfolio. So how do you put like investments together and what are the different characteristics on stock? So you pick like four companies that we all know and it's, it's super interesting to go through the different characteristics maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Emily, because investing in financial market, it's a bit more complex and unfortunately than simply choosing between equity, bonds and cash and commodities. As an investor, there is several things to do in order to succeed. First, it's choosing the companies that exhibit the best capabilities, the best products, the best business model compared to their competitors. And it is what we call the stock selection, company selection. And then we need to adapt the stocks that we own in our portfolio according to where we are in the cycle. And that's what I've shown. It's called market allocation. And for market allocation, it's not just choosing the right company. And I have put the example of four companies that you all know very well and that exhibit very different business model and characteristic, but which makes them more suitable for one phase of the economic cycle versus the other. So let's start. If we take Tesla, that design and manufacture electric vehicles, and Volkswagen, which is the German multinational automotive manufacturer, both of them are producing cars, but they are exhibiting very different characteristics. Because for Tesla, for instance, you have a growth trajectory that is very steep and much more attractive than for Volkswagen. However, Tesla management is more focused on volume target over profit, meaning that they are investing a lot of money, they are doing aggressive price cuts on their vehicle, and that was all over the news over the last days. But the idea of a cutting price is really to boost demand. So if margin per car is higher than Volkswagen or any other classic car company, as investment is super high and volume are much lower than Volkswagen, for instance, at the end, the net income, the global net income of Volkswagen is higher than Tesla. But gross prospects over the long term are better for Tesla than for Volkswagen which justify, and that we have the price earning at the, at the bottom, uh, which justify higher valuation for Tesla because I'm able to pay more, uh, for more money for Tesla because I can have very long-term growth prospects. But with this characteristic in mind, a company like Tesla will be more suitable for the recovery phase of the cycle because you remember in a recovery phase, we are looking for companies that can benefit from better growth prospect and that could exhibit high valuation. While a company like Volkswagen is better when global growth is at the top, inflation is rising because Volkswagen is boosted by the global economic cycle. And as inflation is rising, investors are much more focused on valuation. So that's the example of Tesla and Volkswagen. But then you can find other companies that can fit well, for instance, in the slowdown phase. And I think a company like Microsoft could be interesting because Microsoft is really the top beneficiary of a growing digital shift. And uh, it meaning that they are really able to grow independently from the global macroeconomic cycle. So if we are global growth is slowing down, we don't care. Microsoft will survive. They have a high profitability and they are not that expensive. But during the recession phase, uh, Nestle will be a much better idea because if sales growth over five years is 0%, so not very attractive, what is interesting is that it's super stable. And a company like Nestle is almost not impacted by the global environment. They offer nice profitability and very sound fundamental, which could be very interesting in a recession phase. So it's really picking the right sector, the right kind of companies. And for that, you just do financial analysis of the key characteristics. And now if, we, uh, if we're looking at you know, more broadly, like 
what are maybe coming at what are your investment themes uh you know in, in the current environment um we discussed healthcare we discussed luxury in the past we discussed china uh, but what what are you looking at at the moment yeah, because like I said, the reality of market is not always always matching perfectly the theory. So that's why I wanted to go uh, with you through the thematics that we are judging super important today. Uh, first, the first thematic, and it's the country actually, it's Europe, uh, because we think that Europe uh, could go well, go well because in in the, in the coming months, because as we as I said. Uh, recession uh, is ending and we are getting towards the recovery phase which will be as you remember, remember in the investment clock a tailwind for equity and europe is also benefiting like i mentioned earlier several uh, benefiting from several important tailwinds the fact that china is reopening the fact that we have lower energy prices and the fact that europe is exhibiting much uh, more attractive valuation than the us which is highly important in a world of higher inflation. So we think that definitely Europe could be a good idea versus the US in terms of investment thematic. Then if we look more on a sector approach, I mentioned it uh, in, our, in our last webinar and it's still true, uh, the luxury sectors could still be a good idea. Uh, we talk about it it's a recession proof sector because you know luxury brands are pretty insulated uh, in economic slowdown because most of their sales come from the super wealthy people uh, just a reminder luxury brand count on just 20 percent of their uh, of its client from 20 percent of the client make most of the sales and these clients are the ultra wealthy and very healthy wealthy people meaning that they are not impacted by any economic recession and this company have a huge pricing power a company like hermes for instance have been raising prices uh, across the, uh, the uh, during the last weeks um, without any issue and luxury company will benefit from the recovery of the chinese consumer uh, is that in this should benefit to China, but also to the rest of the world, because Chinese people will start traveling again and, uh, and uh, buy uh, in Paris, in London, uh, uh, and uh, across Asia. Another sector that is interesting is healthcare. Uh, I mentioned it, it's very, very a defensive sector, not sensitive to inflation and relying on, on, uh, on very structural trends like aging population, the fact that we have are having more and more chronic disease, for instance, and also the fact that we are increase a, a huge increase in healthcare spending in emerging market. So all these trends are huge support for the healthcare sector, and it is whatever the economic outlook could be. And then there is a last uh, sector, which is oil. Uh, Oil, it's typically the, the, the thematic, if you listen to me earlier, that we should not buy at this stage of the cycle. But as I said, the reality of market is not always matching perfectly the theory. And today, all companies are supported by several uh, facts, like the Chinese re reopening. China will uh, ask a lot of oil in order to support the, recover the reopening of their economy. And over the medium term, beyond just the China reopening, uh, we will have a demand that is pretty stable because the energy transition takes time. So demand will remain quite stable. But at the same time, supply is super constrained in the oil sector. There has been no investment in the oil sector over the last 10 years, meaning that today we have a huge imbalance between demand and supply of oil which should support the price of oil and therefore oil companies. Um, in, um, in your outlook, you mentioned the case uh, of China and we see, we see it here um, in your graph that is desynchronized with the, with the rest of the world. Um, do you see it as an investment opportunity? Yeah, I, I mentioned the four thematic uh, just before, but there is a fifth one, which is China, who should stand apart uh, this year. And it, not, it, uh, it has not always been the case. Unfortunately, last year, China stock uh, reached their lowest level since 2005. Due to several risk factors that has been impacting a lot China in the past 18 months. 
And these factors are reversing right now. The first factor that was highly negative for China was regulation, especially regulation on tech company. It was super, super restrictive. And I think that one good example is that 18 months ago, Chinese authority ordered the App Store in China to remove Didi. Didi, it's the right hailing giant, really the equivalent of Uber, as big as Uber in our economy uh, in China. And Chinese authorities say, no, no, we are removing Didi because uh, the platform was uh, illegally collecting user data. So Didi user that still have the app where could use it, but they were not able to have new user. It was completely impossible to upload the app. And few days ago, actually, the ban has been lifted by the Chinese authority because what they are doing is in order to boost growth, they have decided to ease regulation on the big tech company. Another thing that they have decided to ease is, we mentioned it, the COVID policy, uh, zero COVID policy, because they had three years of zero COVID policy, meaning lockdown, mass, tech mass testing, contact tracing app, quarantine. It was really uh, 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 completely, completely uh, crazy. And Xi Jinping decided to make a U-turn. Therefore, we have finally mobility that is starting to normalize. And every, all the Chinese are traveling right now because it's the Lunar uh, New Year travel. And so there is a peak in COVID right now in China. But uh, by end of March, end of April, we should see the number of COVID cases stabilizing, and therefore we should see a, a boost in Chinese growth. And the last risk factor that hurt China a lot was geopolitical risk, the tension between the US, China, and Taiwan. It's a structural issue, unfortunately, and investors were very, very concerned. It will not just disappear like that. Tension will remain, but it's a bit better than what we had one year ago because uh, President Xi and President Biden uh, talked during the G20 in Bali. So it's a bit better and it's offering a relief for investors and therefore it's creating an opportunity to invest in China. And what we have to keep in mind is that China is really a leading emerging market player with a global powerhouse, and it's a must have for equity investors who are looking for growth. China, it's the third, it's the second biggest market in the world in terms of market capitalization after the United States, and it contributes to 70% of global GDP. So if you are a global investor, at some time, you should look to China. Yeah, just uh, one last slide on China to, to, to have a better illustration of what we can do in China. Uh, in China, we have a 1.4 billion population and it's uh, one of the world's largest consumer market. Uh, and so after three years of lockdown, Chinese consumer have accumulated massive saving that they are now ready to spend. Therefore, it's a very, very good news for all the Chinese consumer company uh, and that should benefit to a very broad set of company from the e-commerce company because uh, e-commerce should still be boosted even if uh, China is reopening because consumers are still worried about the COVID and they are much more connected than what we are uh, in, uh, in developed country, uh, especially the new generation. So they are huge consumer of e-commerce. But the recovery uh, will also benefit from all the country around. Uh, we have, for instance, a huge boost of reservation for Singapore, uh, but also for European countries. So the fact that the Chinese consumer will spend a lot of money will be a good news for Chinese consumer company, but also for uh, a company outside China. Thank you, Axel. Um, yeah, I love I love this uh, this last last slide. Um, and this it's a topic we're, we're discussing actually this week at Vespa. It's like financial bubbles, so that's really relevant. Yeah, because it was to conclude because we talk about China, we talk about the big tech, and I think that beyond the economic cycle and the implications that you had on market, we have this very very long trend on financial markets uh, that are super important and that's a kind of bubble. And the most recent one has been the FANG, so the Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. 
the thing, it was really the reference over the last decade, the best way for investor to capture superior growth versus the rest of the market in an environment, to be honest, where growth were pretty scarce. So this company with huge sustainable competitive advantage, high operating leverage, sustainable growth trajectory seems really unstoppable until last year. And like I mentioned in, a, in our Q&A, uh, Emily, it's the mindset that prevail uh, over the last year have changed. Now tech company are expected to make profit uh, finally, and not only to, to, to prepare a long-term growth. And therefore we are seeing this bubble on the tech, big tech companies that start to burst. It was not the first one we had one bubble every uh, every 10 years approximately and i think that the lesson that we can uh, we can uh, have to conclude is that we have this example that trends fade over time and so as an investor the main conclusion is we need to be diversified in our investment and not only bet on one big trend we need to be long term that for sure but we also need to be active so if not active yourself, is helped by an active um, manager that will help you to just manage the, the cycle and manage this underlying bit trend. Uh, and that's why also it's always interesting to be helped by experts, uh, for instance, through mutual fund, in order to help you in this very, very complex environment that are financial markets. Thank you, Axel. Um, that was fascinating. Thank you for preparing this, this update uh, with us. So we have a few questions just for me. So the main takeaways, I mean, you talked about, you know, diversification, uh, you know, holding this portfolio, getting some help and, and support uh, when you need to. I think it's for investors holding assets in their portfolios according to the phases of economic cycle. So maybe, you know, if we look in terms of, of recovery in China, for example, you would look to be exposed to maybe, you know, equity is something that's more like cyclical. However, when we see a slowdown, maybe looking at something that's a little bit more defensive, um, looking at uh, investors will be looking at cash, will be looking at bonds. So it's how do you rebalance your, your portfolios uh, during economic cycles. Um, we looked at four different stocks from Tesla, Volkswagen, Microsoft, and Nestle. And this is always like a super interesting exercise to just understand the level of pricing, the dynamics, the financial between the, these different companies. And maybe that's something we could, uh, you know, dive in a little bit more also um, in, the, in, the, in the next market update, if that's something you're interested in. Um, you mentioned four themes plus one <laughs> that could be interesting <laughs> so uh, luxury sector healthcare oil and, and europe and also of course the reopening um, of of china um and finally for for us it's going to be yeah looking at you know what's happening in terms of you know inflation growth um seeing what's happening in in, in europe and really if you're new uh, to to the investing it's maybe you know getting started there's no right or wrong <laughs> time to actually get started investing in the in the stock market so axel i guess there's no right time we can't tell us if it's now <laughs> but the, the earlier uh, earlier always uh, the earlier always is always the better best. and for being long term and for being long term um thanks axel maybe so we have a few questions the first one is any views on the uk market um and especially mid cap small cap uh, funds yeah, so the UK market outlook is quite similar to the one in Europe. Uh, we are in, in quite the same situation. The Bank of England should raise interest rate by 0.5% next week from the current level of 3.5%. It has been uh, an historic move huh, because uh, in November 2021, uh, rate from the Bank of England were at 0.1%. So it has been a very, very sharp rise from the Bank of England in order to curb the high inflation outlook. Globally, uh, for, um, for UK companies and consumers, we have a huge relief from the, the gas prices uh, because the UK was one of the countries the most impacted by, um, by the surge uh, in gas prices. Uh, UK households have faced some of the highest price in Europe mostly due to structural reason, because uh, the country relies more heavily on gas and uh, its European neighbors. 
uh, because they, in the UK, you have less nuclear and re renewable energy in the energy mix, uh, mix rather uh, compared to, to some other European country. And also the UK uh, it does not have a lot of capacity to store gas. Therefore, they have been forced to buy on short term market um, where there is a much greater volatility in prices. But as we have now the relief on gas pricing, inflation is going down uh, from the 10.7% in November to 10.5% in December and it's and keep decreasing. And therefore it's a relief on inflation and on the Bank of England and also for equity investors. You have to keep in mind that the UK economy is super cyclical. Therefore, they are very sensitive to all the trends you have in the market. So they will be more sensitive to inflation, but they will be also more sensitive to disinflation. And when we have a slowdown, they will tend to be more sensitive to the slowdown, the same when we have growth going up. But the issue with the UK and the same for Europe, the same for the US is still long term inflation, because what we have in the UK, especially, is that more people in Britain uh, than in other uh, any other developed countries have left the labor force since the start of the pandemic, which is limiting production and adding to price pressure. And so British inflation is one of the highest in uh, among uh, large economy. And what we, we are seeing is that UK business investment has been lagging behind historical average due to the uncertainty uh, after the, the Brexit. Therefore, it's some things that the Bank of England have to keep in mind and some things that same for the US and for Europe will put a cap on the valuation expansion in the, in the equity market. So then you are looking at earnings, therefore growth as a key driver for equity. And when we look at growth, the data suggests that the UK did not fall into recession uh, in the last quarter of the year, uh, which was widely anticipated. So it's a better news than expected. However, the fact that we have higher interest rates that is pushing more and more pressure on borrowers, the fact that with this higher interest rate um, will weaken uh, the, the housing market and will erode uh, the consumer confidence, will mean that recession mean, should only be delayed and not really avoided. So it will be something that could hurt at some point uh, the UK company uh, in, uh, in 2023. And so you have to be very selective, like I mentioned, uh, choosing the companies that are exposed to China, for instance, choosing the companies that will benefit from the fact that last year um, the bound has, uh, has been much weaker, boosting uh, export, and uh, finding companies that can do well in, uh, in an environment where inflation remains super sticky. Thank you, Axel. Um, we have a, a question about selecting funds to follow um, the cycle, any key metrics, um, and maybe something I, I would add to that is um, you mentioned China. I think historically for me, it, it, it's been a bit challenging to get exposed to, to China, just to, you know, to find the right, the right funds. So how, uh, how can, we, can we get started doing some, some research about the funds? Yeah, so in terms of funds, you have different kinds of funds. So you have equity funds, uh, and then within equity funds, you will have funds that invest globally in the world. You will have funds investing in the UK, investing in Europe, investing in China. Uh, and you will have funds uh, more exposed to what we call growth stocks, so the stocks that are performing well in, uh, in some kind of environment, or uh, funds that are exposed to what we call value stocks, so stocks performing in another kind of, uh, of uh, world. The best thing to do is just if you want to get exposed to equity, and if you don't want to manage it, is to take a fund that is very broad in terms of style and in terms of region. Therefore, you just let the fund manager do the job and do the allocation for you. And what could be even more interesting is buying a fund that is not only invested in equity, but also mixing equity and bonds at the same time. It's called diversified fund, mixed fund. And that's super interesting because they will do the allocation within the equity. And they also at the same time will do the allocation between bonds and equity. And so perfectly playing the investment cycles that have shown you. 
And talking about China, that's true that as an individual investor, it's quite tough to invest in China. Uh, because if uh, if China offer great investment opportunity, uh, it's a highly volatile country, uh, highly volatile equity market, and so you should be uh, you should be quite an expert to to invest well uh, in China, and you should be very selective in China, much more selective than any other market. Uh, that's why, for instance, at Carmignac, we only focus on the new economy stocks, the ones that have the better potential, according to us. Because the China new economy, it's really the result of current strategic plan uh, from the Chinese government that are planning to make China more technology self-sufficient um, and, uh, and therefore really pushing for the development of Chinese tech company. And within this China new economy, you have all companies linked to consumption, technological innovation, health, urbanization. That will be the key driver of the Chinese growth. But, but being very selective, you can really exploit the potential of the Chinese economy over the long term. And so what we do is that we have, for instance, at Carmignac, two funds that invest massively in China, one fund named Carmignac Emergent and one fund focused on China named Carmignac China New Economy. And what we do is that rather, for instance, to just replicate the stock market index, we are looking for stocks that we believe offer the best potential based on our country expertise. Because at Carmignac, we have been investing in China for more than 30 years. And so we really believe that it's key to go in China, to visit company, to meet and talk to the, the, the company businessmen, to identify competitors, to identify the partner in order to find the best opportunity while reducing the risk. And so that's why uh, relying on an expert on a country like China is even more important than for the US or for Europe. Thank you, Axel. Um, we have like two more minutes. I just wanted to launch a very quick uh, quiz, a last poll uh, for everyone. And I know there's a few outstanding questions, but we'll answer these actually uh, made in the, in the follow-up article and we will also be sending the recording. So if you're still here, we have a quick poll, one minute. <laughs> uh, and I hope you, you listen to Axel. <laughs> <laughs> So the first question is when an economy is in a recovery phase. So for example, we talked about China today. What in theory should you, an investor, hold in your portfolio? Cash or bonds or equities? Then what is likely to cause sticky inflation in 2023? Is it higher prices for goods or higher wages in the service labor market? And finally, <laughs> did this seminar help you to learn more about the stock market? This one is, a, <laughs> is an easy one. I'll give you just one more minute and great. Yeah, we see some great, uh, great answers here. So I'm just gonna end the poll because I know you all need to go very soon. Let me share the results. Um, yeah, so well done. Uh, in a recovery phase, you, you tend to look more at uh, equities, shares, and growth, and what is likely to cause stick inflation, higher wages, and did this webinar help you to learn more? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so big thank you, uh, Axel. Thanks to you. Thanks to thank Carmen. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, It's always a pleasure for... to have you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, and we've added a few resources in the chat box so that there's amazing information on Carmignac's uh, insights page. So I would definitely go there. Um, there's a lot of you know videos and, and articles. You can follow Axel on, on LinkedIn and we'll prepare like a YouTube video. We'll prepare a podcast episode and we'll write our main takeaways. Everything is going to be available on uh, on Vespod next week. So thank you, everyone. Um, and thank have you. a good afternoon. Thanks, Thanks Axel. Bye. See you soon. Bye.